Good morning. Thank you for coming. Beautiful day outside. Today I'll show you the notes that I added to Friday's section of week six, where I try to include some key quotes and also present in a brief format the elements that are compatible with our reading of Machiavelli. And then we are going to see another segment from the first part of the movie, The Godfather. And after that, I would like to hear your reactions since there wasn't time on Friday last week, although I read, uh, it was interesting for me to read your, your notes, the notes that you took. And if you haven't collected your notes, I still have a handful in my bag if you want to see uh, the comments I left. In some instances, I left more comments. In other instances, just a check mark to show that I read that and that um, what, what you wrote was fine, okay? So, here are the notes, if you remember, last week we watched the beginning of the movie, which is significant for the genre, the fact that you don't start with criminal activities displayed on the screen, rather you start with a marriage, and that really shows a deeper understanding of what organized crime is, because organized crime is not just about criminal against society, it's about criminal networked within society with several elements, especially elements at the top. There is no or successful criminal organization without connections with politics and politicians and also underneath that top level of control of society, orga criminal organizations cultivate also connections with the press or the media, with the judicial system, with the police system, okay? And that's what makes several of those organizations in the world, in here we're talking about the mafia, quite successful. And their success, their prolonged success, is telling us that there is already something Machiavellian because it is repeatable, okay? Only in this case, the skills are not placed as Machiavelli saw them within his historical context, in the mind, in the persona of the leader. Really, for a criminal organizations, there is a lot of skills that are built into the organization itself, which is why oftentimes when you examine the trials, when you look at the lower levels, not just the lowest, but more than one level, you find that the criminals involved in those activities are often not the brightest in elements of society. Yet it works. It works because there, is, there are mechanisms built into the system that make it work, okay? Which is not unique, right? The same can be said for gangs. We're not going to deal with gangs in the class, but you have to wonder why are gangs around the world in various formats, so successful, right? It's not, again, about their leaders, it's not about the smartness of the members, it's about the mechanism, the operation, the typical operations of the gang that makes it easier to succeed and retain, gain and retain control in a particular context. We said there is a lot of necessity, there is a lot of emphasis on the element of necessity. That is to say, you have here criminals that are not portrayed as violent beasts, animals that have this instinctive proclivity to violence. Rather, you have people who are uh, perfectly calm and controlled. You have the initial scene in which Don Vito Corleone sits 
listening to the petitioners, Bonasera, The Undertaker, The Baker, Luca Brasi, Johnny Fontaine, with, in, in, in a state of perfect tranquility and renders his judgments with complete wisdom. And in fact, he is the one judging negatively the recommendations of the petitioners such as Bonacera, who would like to have those who assaulted his daughter killed, something that is considered by Don Corleone itself excessive, unnecessary violence. Necessity, we'll see today in the segments that we watch today, is perfectly incarnated in the character of Michael. Michael is the civilian of the family. His father, Don Vito, imagined for him a different kind of life and a different kind of career. And by the end of the movie, when Michael has taken the leadership of the family, his father will tell him that he had imagined that he could become Senator Corleone or Governor Corleone, that he could still have power but a kind of power that wouldn't require him to carry a gun or use one or be surrounded by people who carry guns. Yet, we find that Michael, who's an outstanding citizen, outstanding member of the American community, war hero, someone who, who has a college degree, finds himself in a state of necessity that requires him to become the leader of the family because he has to. Not because he enjoys being violent or thinking of and implementing violent plans, but because after, as we will see at the beginning of today's segment, his father is uh, almost killed in this attempted murder outside of his office right after his father, while his father is buying fruit and vegetable from a street vendor, it's clear that there is no other solution. That his brother, Sonny, James Khan, is so impulsive, doesn't have enough of a mind. The reading that I assigned about the Godfather talks about this characterization of the mafia criminal in the Godfather trilogy as a cerebral criminal, as a criminal that uses mostly his mind, not their muscles, not, or, or their guns, the, the way we saw little Caesar Rico Bandello operate in the previous movie. Michael finds himself in a situation where he has to volunteer and say, I will meet with Solozzo, the guy who proposed that the Corleone family enters the drug trafficking business, and McCluskey, the corrupt police lieutenant who is supporting, helping Solozzo and the Tattaglia family against the Corleone family. There is no other solution, exactly because uh, Michael is considered by everyone a civilian, meaning someone who's not involved, not trained, not prepared for the criminal activities of and the criminal deeds of the Mafia. Exactly for that reason, no one will expect him to be the one who will shoot Solozzo and McCloskey. That's the only solution in that context, right? given the time they have, they're running out of time, given the options they have available, that's the only solution. And therefore, Michael, in a way, sacrifices himself the same way that Machiavelli expects the prince to act. The evil prince of Machiavelli's book is not a monster, is not cruel by nature. He may be an honest, sincere, outstanding individual, and yet, for the good of their group community, in this case, the family, Michael or the prince will have to do things that involve lying, cheating, 
using violence up to the, the extreme act of murdering someone. Go back to what you read even in Boccaccio's The Cameron and the novella of Ciappelletto, who will lie in his confession and convince a holy French priest, well versed in the scriptures, that he, Ciappelletto, is practically a saint and he is canonized and becomes a saint and people are looking for uh, shreds of his clothes to keep as a relic, to pray to, etc. Same kind of situation. Ciappelletto has to. They're running out of time. A solution has to be found. And Ciappelletto will offer to sacrifice his soul, his salvation, to perform this act. There is this element of necessity that changes the moral parameters. Morality and ethics are good and fine, but there are situations that are specific contexts in which the laws of morality and ethics need not apply because they don't ensure the outcome that is sought, the outcome that is desired by the participants. Okay? So we saw last Friday Michael telling Kay about the story, one of the famous trademark phrases of the offer that a bank leader could not refuse. Either Luca Brasi pointed a gun at the bank leader who was holding Johnny Fontaine hostage with a contract and Vito Corleone said, either your brain or your signature will go on that contract. And then later on, you know, uh, if you've seen the movie or even heard about the movie, you know that the lawyer, Tom Hagen, will go to Hollywood, will talk to this producer, Waltz, who doesn't want to give the part to Johnny Fontaine, he will refuse, and the next day, the next morning, he will, will, will wake up with blood on his hands, blood on his pajamas. He will lift the cover of his bed to find the head of his most precious uh, uh, racing horse, Khartoum, in the bed, right? And that is the other image that has made that, that is popular in the audience uh, about this movie, the things that everyone remembers about this movie. Michael will initially just say, hey, that is my family, that is not me, to his very Anglo fiancé. But then, once Michael finds out, as we will see at the end of this segment, that his father is left unguarded in the hospital, that someone is coming to kill him, Michael will promise his father, I will take care of you now. And because of the need to protect his family, he will turn into the next godfather, the next Don Corleone, okay? This is an element of necessity which is intrinsically Machiavellian. And again, it confirms what we were saying on Wednesday about Machiavellianism being especially applicable as an ideology or a system to critical situations. And here we find critical situations throughout the trilogy. Michael will try to go back to the civilian's life to make the business of his family completely legitimate, something that will, he will promise to Kay uh, uh, that eventually will become his wife, and yet he'll be prevented either by traitors in his organization and family or by rival organizations or by society itself because especially in the second and then the third movie the message of the film is the mafia is not the only criminal organization in fact uh, such criminal fights struggles for power are the game of politicians the church the uh, big managers, right? So it's not surprising that you find mafiosi acting this way. In a way, their game is much smaller than the game played by the big leader, leaders of the world. So I suggest that you review these notes when you have time. And of course, you can ask me questions if any points are not particularly clear or any quotes 
need to be placed in context. Right now, I will switch to the movie so that we have enough time for a discussion. If we can close the curtains to enjoy the movie a little better. <coughs> So, as I said before, between the segment we saw last Friday and this segment, we have Tom Hagen going to Hollywood to convince the producer to hire Johnny Fontaine, give him a part in this movie. And then we have the negotiations between Solozzo and the Tatalia family and the Corleones about committing resources and influence to the support of drug trafficking. Don Corleone says no, but Sonny, his son, his older son, clearly would like to enter into this business, as well as Tom Hagen, the consigliere, the lawyer of the family. That's the reason why Luca Brasi first, and then Don Corleone are killed, or an attempt is made to eliminate them, Luca is killed, uh, and the Don will survive. And with the demise of the Don, Sonny shows that he has not, doesn't have the leadership skills because he's too impulsive, doesn't have enough of a brain for this kind of criminal activity, and Michael will step in. And throughout the, uh, this series of scenes, you see a lot of quotes and situations that are in many ways, Machiavellian. And that was the extent of the film that I wanted to show you. And we have about 10 minutes for questions and comments, both on the scenes we, we saw today and what you saw last Friday. Or if you have questions about the rest of the movie, I can summarize how the movie continues and ends. As I said before, the film was released at the end of February for the 50th anniversary, it came out in 1972. Um, it's still found, not in this area, the last date for this area was Wednesday. I know because I missed it, uh, but you can still find it in some theaters in Huntington or the city. But of course, even those theaters will not have the movie through the day, they will just have one or two times during the day when you can find the 50th anniversary, and then it'll be released, I believe, March 22nd in the 4K version. Okay, questions, comments about the movie? Yes, Christine. It's kind of a, uh, something that I didn't really remember, and having not seen the movie uh, in a few years, was just the, was kind of that they actually do place kind of a bit of emphasis on Michael's experience at war while not detailing what that entailed and clearly that just teaches him some kind of skills of avoiding you know situations where he's going to get killed any at any given second well there is no emphasis on his war hero experience either because the assumption is that uh, justified killing following the orders of officers doesn't really prepare for uh, violence in uh, the context of a criminal activity, or you can assume what's really true of hundreds of thousands, if not millions of soldiers during World War II, that they served in areas where they saw very little combat or no combat at all. Because that's, no matter how global that war was, so many tens of millions of people were deployed in various front lines, and there was a need to guard, let's say, the war in the Pacific. There were so many islands where sometimes if you got assigned to an island after it was captured by the Americans, you might not have seen a, a Japanese ship or Japanese soldiers for the rest of the war, and yet a garrison had to be kept there. The same is true for other places, Italy, Greece, etc. If, if you had to station and guard a place where the war had passed, then that was your, your term of duty, okay? So maybe you, you don't become that tough based on that. So the war hero 
definition, the fact that he comes in in the first scene with a military uniform serves the purpose, as, as the reading I assigned emphasizes, of placing Michael inside the context of regular society and outside the context of the mafia business, right? And then he will move in. You will see him in this kind of uh, war meeting after uh, Don Vito Corleone has been shot, where they're talking about killing members of the Tatalia family, and he's asking, are you going to kill all of them? But he's kind of out, right? He's assigned to making phone calls, staying in the house, consoling his mother. But little by little, he'll get involved more and more, and you'll see him physically get different placements. He'll be on different chairs, and finally, by the end of the movie, we will see him on the same chair, different chairs that have a different kind of uh, importance, relevance in the space. And then by the end of the movie, you see him in the same office where the movie started, behind the same desk where his father was, and with the same chair. And of course, at the end of the movie, first he will deny, promise uh, his wife, Kay, that he had no, uh, uh, was not involved in the killing of Carlo, Sonny's husband, Connie's husband, uh, the, the, the groom of the marriage scene, when in fact he ordered Carlo to be executed. And then people will uh, uh, bow be before him, call him a godfather, kiss his ring, or, or do that kind of gesture. And at, in the very final scene, Kay has left the study. She turns back. She is first relieved because she thinks he was sincere when he said, I had nothing to do with Carlos' murder. Then she turns back and she sees the scene in the study from the living room of the house or the dining room. And, uh, and, and she sees people paying homage to the new authority, established authority of Michael. And the very last frame is Neri, the new Luca Brasi, the new killer working for Michael, coming to the door, looking at Kay, and very intentionally closing the door to separate the business of that part of the family from the rest of the life of the family. There is communication and there is separation between family business and criminal activities. Other comments, other questions? Yes. Um, I think the hospital scene was really, it was shot very well too, in that um, the angle of the shot, especially the stairway scene, it looks like um, the, two, the nurse and Michael are being watched. So it yes. makes the audience also feel tense, and yes. the use of music was really good too. And the insistence on empty spaces, of course, we are also trained as viewer into the tropes of cinema. So if you see an insistence on the emptiness of the spaces, you know that those spaces are about to be invaded, right? You expect that. So when is it that they're coming? And then you add the, the echo of the steps of uh, Enzo, the baker, coming up and you think the killer is coming. There is going to be a confrontation. Michael is not armed. No one is there to protect his father, etc. And in general, throughout the movie, the interior scenes are much better than uh, the other. The scenes in the office and in the house in general are, are much better than the other. Not, not that Coppola did a bad job, but certainly he excelled in those uh, scenes in, in his directorial art or technique. How did you learn uh, to be the Don so quickly? Was it just, was he always like watching his father and just didn't want to do it? No, keep in mind the assumption that, that Puzo imbued in the novel, the idea that these men could have excelled as leaders in society, as managers or politicians, but were denied, they're discriminated against, they were denied the opportunity, the proper channels that would uh, uh, propel their careers, so they were born and developed their leadership skills. They were born leaders, they had the smarts, they had the brain. Society didn't offer them the right opportunities. The family did, 
And at that point, they already had the skills. So that's the assumption that society, that those mafia or some of those mafia leaders in real life, Puzo believed that, could have become real leaders of society, but could only express their leadership that nature gave them, that they developed through their experiences in that context, the context of organized crime. So that's the ideology, the underlying ideology. That's why he's ready. It's not even that he lived in the family and absorbed the business of the family. No, it's just that he's a smart man, a born leader, and you see him pensive, right? Son is impulsive, Michael is pensive, right? And, and you find him very controlled in the marriage scene, then very silent on the bench with K. His brain is, is spinning, right? He's thinking about this situation all the time. He's, he's preparing mentally. He's transforming first spiritually, and then he uh, gets involved. He, he goes into action mode. Right? That's what you have to understand. The idea that these are leader would have been leaders. Society confined their leadership to this uh, margin of activity, marginal business, which is crime. And then through the rest of the trilogy, the ideology is, well, is it really marginal or is it power always criminal in one way or the other? Only criminals get on to jail and bishops and popes and uh, big CEOs and big politicians manage to uh, not get to jail and are admired, etc. But it's all a dirty business when it comes to power. They're all powerful men. In fact, at the end of the movie, there is a brief dialogue when Michael comes back to America. He's sent to Sicily after he kills Solotto and McCloskey to hide, comes back. A year later, he goes and finds Kay, who's working as an elementary school teacher or a kindergarten teacher, talks to her in the street. And uh, she says, you, you've, t you've taken over the, the business of your father. So y y she, she hints to the fact that she knows that he's now a criminal. And he says, practically in this dialogue, well, all, all powerful people are criminal are involved in homicides because she tells, oh, you, you, you are involved with murders. And, and he says, well, you are being naive because even leaders in other areas of society have their hands there too.